Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. It's okay, you can say it back. Merry Christmas. It is Christmas, and there is no place that I would rather be than here with you, worshiping our God together as his church. It is God who calls us into worship with these words about our Lord Jesus Christ from 1 Peter chapter 1. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. If you are able, please rise for worship. People of God, from where does your help come? Receive his greeting. Grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What could be more appropriate on this Christmas morning than singing a new song, remembering the new thing that our God did all those years ago in Bethlehem when heaven came down in the manger? Let's sing a new song with all creation, declaring the reign of Jesus Christ as our King. Psalm 96, the stanzas 1, 6, 7, and 8. bow with me in prayer, asking for a blessing on this worship service. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we come before you as your congregation on this very special day, this day when we remember when you did something completely new, something that the angels longed to look into, something that had never been done before. You gave your people a Savior, but this time you didn't raise one up, but you sent one down. 
You gave us not only a baby in the manger, but a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Truly, with all creation, we should shout forth our gladness, our thankfulness, our joy. Lord, we thank you for this wondrous gift, and we confess that we do not deserve it. We do not deserve any of your blessings, but out of love you continue to shower us with them. Gracious God, we worship you and we adore you for who you are and what you have done. To see us in our helplessness and our hopelessness, and then choose to love us anyways. To choose us, to pursue us, to rescue us, woo us, protect us, and lavish your love upon us. We are truly in awe. And we ask, O Lord, that you would grant us what we need this Christmas day. When we are distracted by various difficult things, loss, sadness, frustration, and various pleasant things, presents, tinsel, and food, Lord, let us focus on you above all and everything that you have done. Let us truly celebrate this day and let us celebrate it rightly. All of this we pray in Jesus Christ, our Savior, who came on this Christmas day. Amen. Well, we are here. Advent is over. Christmas has come. And so we have come to that time when heaven truly came down to earth. And the shepherds were able to be witness of that. Let's open Holy Scripture together to the very last verse of Luke chapter 1. By now, we've gotten to know each other fairly well here. You know that I'm not in favor of tradition for tradition's sake. I sometimes like to buck the trends and forge my own path. But this Christmas, we will be looking together at the classic Christmas story. But I couldn't resist making it slightly unique, and so we're reading one verse from the previous chapter. Um, There's a reason for that too, though. Um, Nothing fancy, nothing fancy, nothing out there, nothing extreme. This tradition of Luke chapter 2 which I love is not just simply tradition for tradition's sake, but it's a rich and wonderful passage to reflect on at this time of year. So let's read Luke chapter 1, verse 80 to 2, verse 20. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had, they had heard and seen as it had been told them. In response to our reading, let us raise our voices and sing, putting ourselves in the position of those who finally received their Messiah and Lord for the first time. Hymn 19, 
the stanzas one, three, and four. Since we already read our text together in context, I won't read it again, but I do encourage you to keep your Bibles open as we'll be going through the story of the first Christmas bit by bit. After the sermon, we will sing our Amen song of Hymn 21, the stanzas 1 through 4 and 6. May God bless the preaching of his word. People of God, congregation of Jesus Christ, Merry Christmas, hallelujah, the day is here. Christmas and Easter, the two high points in the Christian calendar, they both require a hallelujah. At Christmas time, these hallelujahs, they don't just come from our own lips. These hallelujahs, they don't just sound in the church building, but we hear the glorious strains of the hallelujah chorus. A song that some wonder if we'll be singing in heaven one day with the angels. Truly a masterpiece. Now for those of you who are bracing for impact, don't worry, you can unclench. I'm not going to ruin the hallelujah chorus for you this morning or ever. It's an amazing piece of music that is wonderful and glorifying to God. And the hallelujah chorus is a song that's aptly named. The word hallelujah appears a whopping 167 times in the song. And so if you're, if you're like me, when, when you listen to this, you might wonder what exactly this term hallelujah means. It's a word we get right from the Bible. We'll sing this word together later in the service with Psalm 150. But is this just a clump of random syllables strung together somewhat like the word huzzah? Well, no, it's, it's not random. And it's a word that's not actually for everyone. Hallelujah, Christians may say, is our word. People of other faiths, people of no faith, they can't really use it, at least not in its true meaning. The word hallelujah, it's a Hebrew word. It's actually two Hebrew words sort of shoved together. Hallelu and Yah. And because this is something important, and because it follows my Christmas tradition here in Cloverdale, we're going to be doing a bit of grammar on Christmas. Like with all the elements of the, Christian, of the Christmas story, we romanticize this 
And so the confusing elements are brushed away due to our familiarity with them. Of course it was shepherds. We all know this. But why was it shepherds? Let's take a look at the story and see if we can find out. Verse 1, in those days, which days are these? That's why we read the verse before. These are the days when John the Baptist had been born. He grew. He became strong in spirit. And then something curious. We read that he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So Zechariah and Elizabeth, whether they're historically absent, they're at least narratively absent here, their story is over. John the Baptist is out of the house. He's out of town. He's in the wilderness all alone. Their story is over, and it's time for a new generation. Time for John and Jesus to come on the scene. Zechariah and Elizabeth's time, or their purpose, rather, in the kingdom of God, conceiving and bearing the forerunner of the Messiah, their earthly purpose was done, and so they exit the scene. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And we could spend a great deal of time on this, spend a great deal of time researching it, but that's all left on the cutting room floor, comparing the biblical record with other historical records, but that's not really the point. We know that there was a census that happened. He was a governor of Syria, and he was governor of Syria for two different terms, whether this was his first one or his second one, we don't know. We know that there was a man named Augustus who was emperor of the Roman Empire at the same time. It all checks out. But instead of trying to figure out the exact timing here, the exact year, let's look instead at the characters in this story. Because it's, it's fascinating. As, as quickly as Augustus and Quirinius are introduced here, they're gone again. Augustus, he gets verse 1. Quirinius, he gets verse 2. But that's it. They enter the story and they exit, never to be heard from again in the entire biblical record. Augustus and Quirinius, two men so important to the secular world. Augustus and Quirinius, among so many others, they missed out on Christmas. Because the ruler of heaven did not appear to the ruler of the known world. Jesus Christ did not appear to Caesar Augustus. We might think it might make sense. Both Jesus and Caesar were called Lord, but of course only one of them was. Both Jesus and Augustus were called Savior, but only Jesus truly saved. Both Jesus and Augustus were called the Son of God, but only Jesus had true divine parentage. But Lord Augustus, ruler of the world, Son of God, Savior, he missed out on Christmas. It wasn't about him. The emperor didn't see heaven come down to earth. Neither did the governor, or King Herod, or the high priest, or other religious leaders. But instead, it was the poor and the forgotten who had heaven suddenly burst open before them. So let's skip ahead to that time. Verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. So we have a location. It's the region around Bethlehem. And we have the characters. We have the shepherds. But just who were these shepherds? Now it's easy for us, 2,000 years separated from this story, to think highly of the shepherds. After all, King David was a shepherd. We know that. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he compares himself, or he, he says that he is the good shepherd. We'll sing this at the end of the service. Loving shepherd of thy sheep. A shepherd we see through the example of David is someone who might be a little rough around the edges, not quite so put together, not in a three-piece suit, willing to get a little dirty, work with their hands, willing to fight off a lion or a bear, but also tender-hearted, filled with love and care for the sheep. Not a soft man, but a tender man. I have this picture of shepherds who would sit back at the end of the day and say, well, it's not much, but at least it's honest work. But that's not who these shepherds were, at least not in the eyes of the community. Instead, shepherds were seen as the lowest rung of society. They were despised and mistrusted. Essentially, all of the stereotypes that we might have about gypsies, vagrants, and con men, this was 
shepherds. All three of those rolled into one. And one more very important thing. Shepherds were ceremonially unclean. They were ceremonially unclean. A shepherd couldn't worship in the temple. A shepherd couldn't approach God because a shepherd worked on the Sabbath. Every week, willingly giving in to sin. And so, little boys, they didn't grow up dreaming of becoming shepherds. The highest rung of the social ladder at that time was to become a rabbi. And all throughout the Torah school, the teachers would be looking for the best and the brightest to ascend the ranks. Those who didn't make it, those who weren't deemed smart enough or holy enough, they might join a family business and become fishermen. They might get sucked into the corrupt business of being a tax collector. Still others might go off and become zealots, cloaking themselves with darkness and murder and intrigue. These men who had been rejected for not, becoming, or for not being the right kind of people to serve God, they might have names like James and John, Matthew and Simon, if you get my drift here. But even these people, even these professions, would be preferable to becoming shepherds. Outcasts of society, rejected by men, told that they were also rejected by God, and they weren't even paid well for it. Now, we don't know about the personal piety, the personal spiritual life of these particular shepherds at the beginning of the story, but we do know about it at the end. Verse 8, and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Now we know the story. It flows so nicely for us. It's not a surprise, but we can be sure that it was a surprise for them. It may have started as a silent night, but it didn't end that way. Silent night, wham, crazy night. Imagine it with me, if you will. A dozen or so cold and hungry shepherds huddled around a small fire that had long since burned down to the embers. But they were too tired to stoke it, so they relied on the sheep surrounding them for warmth. One shepherd, maybe his name is Benjamin, he occasionally taps his staff against the stone wall, trying to scare away the wild animals. A small injured lamb bleats in the night air and comes tottering on three legs, nuzzling its little nose into the crook. Benjamin's arm. It was a silent night. All was calm. And then something changed. Instead of darkness, there was light. But not the light of the fire freshly stoked. This was different. This was radically different. Benjamin turned his eye away from the lamb and looked up into the sky, and it looked as though the stars themselves were exploding. He wanted to turn and say something to the others, but his words were caught up in his throat. It didn't matter. This unearthly light had woken all of them up. And suddenly, the light, it wasn't in the sky anymore, but it was right there in front of them. Benjamin, he shielded his eyes. Most of the sheep ran away in fear. The lamb burrowed itself deeper into his cloak. And then a sound. Whatever was causing this light spoke. Fear not. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. And then it clicked for Benjamin. Those stories in Torah school, they all came flooding back. The angel with the flashing sword at the entrance to the Garden of Eden. The angel who appeared to Joshua outside of Jericho. The angel who appeared to the prophet Daniel and terrified him. Maybe this was an angel. But Joshua was the leader of God's people. Daniel was chosen by God. I'm just Benjamin. I'm just a shepherd. No, Benjamin, just, just listen. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, that which will be for all people. Benjamin, it's not about you. Fear not. This is about the message that the angel is bringing. It's not about you, it's not even about the angel himself, it's about the message. Behold. Listen up, pay attention to this. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And those three titles, they stopped Benjamin's racing thoughts in their tracks. A Savior, Christ the Lord. Finally, a Savior is coming. He's the Messiah and he's the Lord. 
the visit of the angel, the thing that mere seconds ago Benjamin thought would be the high point of his entire life. Even this faded into the background. It truly wasn't about the message. cares about, or so the rabbis say. But wait, there's more. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. A sign for us? Is this really happening? This isn't just a dream, right? And suddenly, there rose with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. Suddenly, thousands of angels appear on the scene, rank and file, thousands upon thousands of angels, an army. Heaven was emptied, and the angels who had been praising God in heaven moments ago, they were suddenly on earth praising him here. A multitude, an army of the hosts of heaven came down. You have been invaded, but do not fear. The salvation is for you and glory for God. Congratulations, you've been rescued multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And there were three things that Benjamin knew for sure in that instant. God was real. There was hope again. And he was loved. And because of these three, there was a fourth. He had to see this baby. Suddenly, as quickly as they came, the army of angels went back to heaven. The night sky was lit once again only by stars. And as his eyes adjusted, Benjamin became aware of the other shepherds again. It wasn't just him and the lamb out in the field. They looked at each other in awe and wonder, this really happened. The shepherds, they said to one another, Verse 15, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Forgetting the sheep, most of whom who had scattered, Benjamin started walking. And then with the other shepherds broke into a run all the way to Bethlehem. Sweating and panting, smelling like sheep in fear and fire, these men burst in on Mary and Joseph and the baby. And in overlapping, excited voices told the story of the angel appearing to them. And how this baby was no ordinary child. You haven't just been given a baby, Mary. You've been given a savior. And Benjamin and the rest, they went on their way. Taking the message of the angels on their lips. Glory to God in the highest. The savior is born. Here, he is the Messiah, the Lord. Hallelujah. This is the story of that first Christmas. This is what happened factually. Historically. Though I suppose it's possible that the shepherd's name wasn't really Benjamin. But this, is, this is the history. But what's the theology? What's the theology behind it? What is the meaning for us here today? For the theology, let's reflect on a few questions together. The questions that we're going to ask are the five typical questions, the five W's. Who, what, where, when, and why? Answer them in a slightly different order, but it's these five questions. First of all, the when. When did all of this happen? Well, it happened this day. Verse 11, for unto you is born this day. We don't know if this day was December 25th. It seems unlikely. But we do know that it happened on a real day. A day in history. Not a mythological day, not an imaginary day, but a real historical day. A day when Caesar Augustus was the emperor and Quirinius was the governor. This was a day that had been planned in eternity past. Before the creation of time, of light, of stars and galaxies, before trees and seas, even before that angelic heavenly host. This was a day that happened at the fullness of time. At just the right time.
our congregational prayer this morning, we lift up the Van Dyke family as well as the Vandergoofden family as Mary's sister-in-law, who is also Ben's aunt. Mary Vandergoofden passed away early yesterday morning, and uh, and Mary's husband, Neil, remains in the hospital, though he is starting to do better. We'll give thanks with the Vanderplug family that Jessica could have gotten married this week. We'll give thanks for the for God's hand of protection and blessing on the Wienendahl family, as despite the loss of their home, they can be here with us safe and sound. And finally, we'll pray also for all those in this congregation who have not been able to make it here this morning, for whatever reason, whether physical, emotional, or spiritual health, that prevented them from making it. We'll pray that they will be returned to us soon, and that they will be blessed today as well. Let's pray. Glorious God. Glorious Lord, God our King, we thank you and we praise you. We worship you for giving us opportunity after opportunity to cry out hallelujah. Truly, the 167 times in the hallelujah chorus aren't nearly enough to praise you for everything that you have done for us. Lord, we thank you individually for sending a Savior even to us. We do not deserve it. We do not earn it with our intelligence or our holiness or kindness or our love. But truly, all good things in this world, all good things in us are from you and are the result of your salvation, not the reason for it. We thank you for protecting and preserving this congregation, leading us to the manger this morning, looking forward to the cross and then to that final day. Gracious Father, We also lift up those who have experienced loss. Lord, we lift up the Van Dyke and the Vandergoofden families as Mary Vandergoofden, sister-in-law to Aaron and Mary, aunt to Ben and Esther, passed away yesterday morning. Lord, we pray that you will guard their hearts as they mourn her loss, that they will be able to grieve, but also not grieve as those who who have no hope. Lord, we pray for Mary's husband, Neil, as he remains in the hospital, we give you thanks that, that so far he is starting to do better. We pray that if it is your will, that you will preserve his life. And Lord, we give you thanks with the Vanderplug family that Jessica, now Baker, could get married this past week. We thank you that there could be a celebration and that members of both families could be here for it. And we pray that you would richly bless Jessica and Chris in their newly married life. Bless especially Ken and Christine as their children are spread far and wide. We thank you that both Jessica and Zach could be back here, at least for a little time. We also lift up the Wienendahl family, and we thank you that you protected them in the sudden and tragic house fire last week. We thank you for their continued health and safety, and we pray that you will continue to bless them with love and support. We thank you for their faith and strength even in this. Please let this be a Christmas to remember for the better. Grant love and joy and peace in you and through your congregation for this family. And Sovereign Lord, we lift up those who cannot be here with us today. Lord, you know their hearts. You know the desires of so many to be here with your people, worshiping you on this special day. Lord, we pray that you would bless them wherever they are, whether in their homes or visiting family or struggling with physical, emotional, or spiritual health concerns. Lord, we pray that you would return each one of your lambs to your sheepfold here, safe and sound, in your perfect timing. And bless us as your congregation, as we seek to be faithful to you in all things. We worship and praise you with our whole hearts, this day and always. Amen. Due to a special request, as well as the fact that it fits so perfectly with our text, let us close with the singing of a hymn of praise to our ultimate shepherd, the true shepherd, who is despised by men but beloved by God, our Savior Jesus Christ. Let's sing hymn 56, Loving Shepherd of Thy Sheep, all four stanzas.
Beloved, it is Christmas. Today we remember the first coming of Jesus Christ into this world. Remember that the true miracle, gift of heaven, wasn't the mighty messengers, but the very human and yet very divine Messiah. The baby who would grow up to save us all. Receive his blessing and go this day in his peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.